Divided up among colonial powers nearly a century on, are rebel fighters redefining national borders and wiping out long-held lines in the sand. Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside Syria. I'm Sami Zaydan. Now, Sunni fighters have laid claim to their first official crossing on the Iraq-Syria border. It's the latest success in an offensive being led by an Al-Qaeda splinter group, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL. All part of a broader quest for an Islamic State stretching from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to Iran. An ambition that would tear up contentious agreements forged between colonial Britain and France almost 100 years ago. Well, this is what the map of the Middle East looked like before European powers created the borders. It had been under the Ottoman rule since the early 16th century, home to a complex and diverse mix of ethnicities, tribes and religions. Then, in 1916, an Englishman and a Frenchman, Marc Sykes and François Georges Picot, devised a way to redraw the map into two spheres of influence. And these lines would form the basis for the modern Middle East borders. Well, this is the map of the region as we know it today. The arbitrary lines Sykes and Picot drew up gave no thought to the ethnic groups they forced together or the tribes they split apart. Well, let me introduce our guests in this edition of Inside Syria Now. We're delighted to have here in the studio Marwan Qablan. He's a Syrian academic and writer and associate analyst at Doha Institute's Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. And joining us from Ankara in Turkey is Taha Ozhan, president of the Center Foundation for Political, Economic and Social Research. And in Washington, D.C., we have Phyllis Benis, a writer, analyst and activist on Middle East issues and fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Good to have you with us. If I could start with Taha Ozhan in Ankara. One way of looking at what's going on in the region right now is you've got a, a rebellion by Sunni groups in Iraq and you have another rebellion by predominantly Sunni groups in Syria. Is this becoming one rebellion? Uh, maybe, but maybe not. But what's more important is why this rebellion is happening and is it possible to not have such a rebellion? I mean, I believe it was not possible. I mean, one way or another, after hundreds of years of the arbitrary, as you said, uh, borders uh, established in the Middle East, one way or another this would, uh, would come and we're experiencing right now. Why? I why mean, was this inevitable? Drive, because I mean the, uh, the 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 lines and the uh, the governments which is sitting on Sykes Pico order itself are arbitrary. Plus that arbitration uh, after Iraqi occupation, those lines are uh, moved. Ethnic, sectarian, and all religious lines are started to move. Uh, U.S. consciously or unconsciously did that. And there are two important what developments in the case of Iraq. In 2005, uh, all those what different groups uh, mixed or excluded in the political system, mainly Sunni Arabs, uh, are excluded from the uh, political uh, establishment in Baghdad, and tensions started. If you remember, 2005 was again a bloody okay. year. Then we. Then okay, let, let me jump in, Tom, before we go back into too much of the history. Uh, Marwan, you know your native Syria pretty well, don't you? It, how much cross-border coordination is there between tribes and groups between Syria and Iraq outside of ISIL right now? Well, even before the ISIL uh, IL emerged, actually, we know that these borders actually have divided one tribe in, on, the, on both sides of the, of the borders. So this movement, cross-border mov movement, uh, never stopped actually any time uh, since the establishment of modern Syria and, uh, and Iraq. And this but has is it intensified, perhaps, given the fact course. that you have on both sides of the border unhappy Sunnis, shall uh, we say? Of course, now, because the borders have been, uh, I mean, uh, uh, effectually, I mean, they have been removed by the IS. So I think the cross borders movement have increased in the past um, uh, in the past few uh, few months. Uh, I think uh, now uh, most of the Sunni tribes that are living uh, alongside the borders between the two countries are in fact against both the regime of Maliki in Baghdad and the regime of Bashar al-Assad in in Iraq, who are somehow they are uh, both in this alliance, uh, of course, with with Iran. So I think the region is becoming to be more identified in terms of sectarian identity rather than being a Syrian or an Iraqi. That's an interesting point. Sectarian identity being strengthened. Phyllis Benis, will the sentiment perhaps of Sunnis, the Sunni rebellion feeling be contained? Can it be contained to the area between Iraq and Syria? 
I think we have to be very careful not to root all of this in the effect of the colonial borders. We had colonial borders drawn in Africa as well, also drawn between and within tribal groups, linguistic groups, ethnic groups. So I think that's certainly an aspect of it, but I think what's more important is the very immediate impact of the U.S. invasion and occupation of 2003. When you saw a, uh, a secular nationalist government that was dominated uh, by one sect, uh, and but was not governing in a sectarian way per se, in, to, in a religious sense, suddenly you, you have that nationalist and secular government overthrown, replaced by a set of, of sectarian defined political parties. And that's where you're seeing very much, I think, this question of sectarian identity. Uh, is emerging to replace national identity. You know, the, the reality is that in the, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, excluding Iran, in the Arab world, Iraq is one of the only, really only two countries that had a historic identity as a, a nation, as a, it wasn't really nation states in the days, but the ancient Mesopotamia was very similar to contemporary Iraq. It doesn't mean that the borders were identical. What's now Kuwait was part of Mesopotamia. What's now uh, Iraqi Kurdistan may not have been. It wasn't exact. But there was an, an old identity as Mesopotamia. There is and was an Iraqi identity. And that's what's being undermined, I think, by this uh, imposition by the United States of sectarian determined political parties. That's very much what, what we're seeing at play now. All right. Talking about uh, playing on the fault lines, I want to take some pictures here that really underscore what's been going on. ISIL fighters have a keen understanding of the region's history and have used it in some of their promotional videos. Let me just show you one which they uh, put out recently when they crossed from Syria to Iraq. <laughs> now, what's uh, written on the bottom of your screen there, Tahtim Hudud al Ar Sykes Pico, which means uh, the ISIL saying, Here we are, destroying the shameful Sykes Pico borders. Let's bring up the next one. You should be able to see, there you go, the border fence there. And, and it, basically, this is the ISIL saying, Here we are, attacking one of the military border posts of the Al Maliki army. Let's bring you another one here. There we go, an interesting shot there. And here we are, the ISL, ISIL saying, Usud al-Dawla al-Islamiyya yaqtahimun al-Hudud wa yaftatahun al-Iddata Turuq, which means here the ISIL fighters are storming the border and even making, building roadways through them. And that's what that bulldozer is doing there. So uh, clearly a lot of uh, hype going on uh, by the ISIL saying, here we are, we're smashing the, the shameful uh, uh, borders. And Taha Ozan, what I'm wondering is, when Sunnis look at pictures like this, regardless of how abhorrent and how they may feel towards the ISIL, will pictures like that not strike a chord with many people? I mean, the idea of destroying these borders. It is, it is, and uh, your precondition is quite important. I mean, they have definitely a very negative feeling of what ISIL is doing. Uh, not to destroying the border, but it is uh, violence against the people and uncontrolled uh, uh, attacks to almost everybody. And they role, especially in Syria, uh, acting as a counter-revolutionary force. But if you just take that into parenthesis and uh, focus on they are uh, exploding that border and claiming they are destroying Sykes-Pico uh, border, it's quite important. And it has a resonance for uh, almost every single uh, identity within this uh, within this region. For Iraq, we should understand Iraq is a microcosm of Middle East. You could find every uh, single element of economic, social, demographic, political, and sociologic sociological things available in Middle East. You can find also in Iraq. So when you touch Iraq in a sectarian way, you're actually uh, moving all these lines. And to understand that thing, your first question at the very beginning: If you just drive from Turkish border all the way down to Baghdad or all the way down to Palestine, you wouldn't feel that sociology has changed much, demography has changed much, and uh, economics has changed much. Same thing happens also if you if you drive from uh, from Kudus to all the way down to uh, Sham, uh, you will feel same thing. So there's an organic thing which 
uh, as Sykes Pico order sits on it, and that thing created something artificial. And that artificiality is right now trembling, and that artificiality is creating a huge crisis. And nation state solution of West after 1918 did not produce anything positive either. All right, so the artificial uh, borders perhaps crumbling there, as Taha Han is pointing out. But why ISIL? Why is a group which had so many problems with, with other Sunni groups uh, earlier this year, we were seeing in your native Syria, other opposition groups uniting to fight it? Why now are they able to storm through Syria to Iraq? Well, I think now, I mean, there is a, there is a point that is really important that we, we must make here. Although that they are trying actually to appeal to the people, most of the people in the region, uh, of course, they know that these are artificial borders between the different Arab countries. But I don't, uh, I feel like they are trying to appeal to the people through this idea. We are trying to establish a united Arab and Muslim state instead of divided, small, little, weak uh, countries. But well, well, I, let me put the question this way, Marwan. Have they reestablished? Establish some kind of alliance with some of the Sunni tribes, uh, whether in Syria or in Iraq, which they had, shall we say, a very strained relationship with before. Okay, that might be uh, that might be true in the case of Iraq, but uh, I would say that in Iraq, for example, it's much more than the ISIL. It's mainly uh, a Sunni tribes that are revolting against the Al Maliki sectarian policies, mm -hmm. which have been pursued over the past a few years. Uh, and I think the ISIL has tried actually to exploit, I mean, the disappointment and the frustration among the Sunni tribes. They have indeed. Uh, uh, have uh, uh, good ties with the most of these tribes now because they have one common enemy, which what, is Al Maliki. temporary alliance. I think it's going to be temporary because in Syria, for example, we don't have we do not we don't see that because an, al the ISIL now is fighting against most of the Syrian opposition uh, uh, groups, which makes which makes it in Syria much weaker than it is in in Iraq. So I think it's a little bit um, uh, the situation is a little bit confusing. I think uh, uh, eventually the Sunni community in both Syria and Iraq will uh, clash with the ISIL because I think it's not going to be the, the policies, the practices of the ISIL are not going to be acceptable by the, ma the majority of the Sunnis. This is one, right. one reason why the ISIL IL won't necessarily have support even for the removal of the borders between Syria and Iraq. We must be really careful when we talk about that. Phyllis Benis, um, if there's a temporary alliance between Sunni tribes in Iraq and some of the, the armed groups like ISIL, what does that mean for Iraq's long term? I mean, will it, can it survive as a state? I think it can survive as a state. I think what we're seeing here is a rising sectarianism that is not just about the ISIL. That's very important. This point about who else is fighting here is really crucial. This is not only the ISIL that mm -hmm. is storming through Iraq. Uh, it is very different than in Syria, where, as we just heard, the ISIL is much weaker, is fighting against, uh, and is being challenged by other resistance forces that are opposed to the regime. Right. In so Iraq, in, in Iraq, you have, have Sunni tribes which are rising up too. You so I mean, what do, tribes, what do they want also, ultimately? An end to the Iraqi state, well, or I, just a bigger piece of it? I no. I th I think this is much narrower. I think that what people are fighting against is the sectarianism of the government that was put in place by the United States and and has been imposed by Al Maliki's regime, a very sectarian regime, where Sunnis were stripped out of the key positions in the military, out of key positions in the government, so that it has become really a Shia sectarian government in Iraq. And you're seeing not only the Sunni tribes that are joining with the ISIL against the government, but you're also seeing remnants of the old regime, from the old military, from the Ba'athist party, who are, have been sort of waiting, perhaps, for some version of this to come about and are allying in a very tactical way with the ISIL. But that is a very tactical alliance. It gives the ISIL a great deal of political, but especially military capacity, because you have some experienced military officers who have been stripped out of their roles in the Iraqi military and are now part of this, uh, uh, this sort of Sunni militia movement. There is a right. danger that 
there could be a real civil war in Iraq right now between Sunni and, and Shia. Which, but which it leads doesn't me, mean the end of Iraq. It leads me nicely to, to my next question, Taha Ozhan. What about, let's talk about the reaction of other countries to what's going on, particularly Gulf countries. What sort of policy do you think they will pursue going forward? They don't want to see, Gulf governments don't want to see the collapse of Sykes-Pico, do they? But they also have to balance that with support for Sunni communities in Syria and Iraq. And, and that, you know, how do you balance all of that? I mean, it's, it's their schizophrenic position. It's a dead luck for them. I mean, all those position. Gulf countries. Yeah, and all those Gulf countries, and you should also include Iran, when it comes to Sykes-Pico, they are in almost more or less same line. They are the last guardians of Sykes-Pico order, one way or another. I mean, uh, Iran, by supporting that Shiite sectarianism, Gulf is directly supporting that Sunni sectarianism. All they are trying to hold on and uh, keep unprotected of the Sykes-Pico order. But this is a deadlock. I mean, uh, we, with, with one way, I'm supporting all those groups, including uh, ISIL. And that ISIL is a, a, a really interesting phenomenon. We know there are several different intelligence operations within in it. We know there are even links with the uh, Maliki government. Uh, we know they have contacts with uh, Iran, uh, Saudi well, hang Arabia. On, hang on, Taha. How do we know all of that? that how do we g g give we know some... we know all, we know all those things in uh, Syrian opposition and their struggle against Assad these are the systematic claims by Syrian opposition that they have links like that there is no proof that's true but we could get that idea uh, when they act as a counter revolutionary force uh, especially in late 2012 when the Assad regime was really weakening or any development that Syrian opposition achieved they one way or another saw that ISIL is is in front of them. Sami, I think when we talk about the regional actors and international, we shouldn't be only talking about Gulf states. I think we have to see that was the reaction. That was the point I wanted to go on to, but go, but go okay, on. Sure. Go now on. I want to see the reaction also of the, of the neighboring countries to the establishment of an Islamic state in Syria and Iraq. Look, Arab nationalists from uh, the, the, the moment the, the Ba'ath Party took power in both Syria and Iraq in 1963, they have been trying, at least at the rhetoric level, to establish a united Arab state in this particular region. But I think on the one hand, they might have uh, produced, I mean, the opposite uh, uh, outcome by consolidating the national borders on one hand, but also the regional and international powers, they wouldn't allow actually the establishment of a bigger state or that change of borders in this mm -hmm. particular area. I think that is going to be very difficult also for the ISIL, I mean, to preserve for a long time. I a beautiful segue now into what I was going to say because the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, he's made some of his strongest comments yet on the conflict in Syria and Iraq. Speaking on Friday, he called for an arms embargo and said Syria was increasingly a failed state. From New York, here's our diplomatic editor, James Bays. A truck bombing in Hama just before dawn in a conflict where the international community stopped counting the death toll long ago. The same moment from a different angle, an explosion that took dozens of lives. But UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon believes some in the international community have lost interest in pursuing peace talks. In an unusually frank speech, he gave his reaction to the indifference of many countries, including members of the Security Council. I'm here to express my anger and disappointment at the cold calculation that seems to be taking hold that little can be done except to arm the parties and watch the conflict rage. In Homs province, airstrikes by Assad's forces. Ban Ki-moon condemned attacks like these, sometimes dropping barrels full of explosives on civilian areas, as well as indiscriminate bombings by the opposition. And he made this call. I urge the Security Council to impose an arms embargo if divisions in the council continues to prevent such a step i urge country to do so individually the secretary general has also written a new report to the security council about the situation in syria al jazeera has obtained a copy it shows 10.8 million people are now in need of humanitarian assistance an increase of 17% the Secretary General is speaking out at a time when Syria's conflict is fast spreading beyond its borders, but his efforts to get an arms embargo already seem doomed. 
Russia's ambassador to the UN says his country, Syria's main weapons supplier, won't be changing its policy. James Bayes, Al Jazeera at the United Nations. So a lot of international uh, pressure already. Taha Ozhan, even if the ISIL, let's take the scenario in which they're crushed, the scenario in which the Iraqi central government placates the Sunni tribes, does that mean that the current borders and political setup is saved as it is? I mean, it may stay as it is. I mean, when we say Sykes-Picot order is uh, falling apart or it's collapsing, I really don't mean, I mean, the current uh, borders are uh, being erased. They may stay, but they may become also meaningless by some kind of very powerful political integration because that's all needed, because there is a sociological integration, there is a demographic integration. Literally, borders are dividing families and tribes, for example, Turkish border. So, I mean, there could be a, some kind of uh, Pax Middle East, let's say, and similar to what European Union did after Second World War. Uh, can we reach there? It is a, what, unimaginable order? No, it's not. It depends on uh, the political transitions and political process to take place. I, that was my point at the very beginning. I wasn't able to complete. Let me say it. In 2010, March 7th, there was an election in Iraq. And the Iraqi movement, which represented first time after occupation, both Sunni Arabs, Shiite Arabs, Sunni Turkmens, Shiite Turkmens, most of the what, differences in Iraq represented in that moment, and they won the election. But somehow, unnamingly, US and Iran agreed to put Maliki in power, although he didn't win the election. And he made a coalition, mostly from the Shiites, and that sectarianism produced ISIL and other problems in the, in the, within the country. And that move was end of the politics in Iraq, because after any election, without knowing the results, we can say who is going to be president, who is going to be prime minister, and who is going to be speaker of the parliament. This is a Lebanization of the Iraq, but Iraq cannot handle uh, Lebanization because Lebanon is a small country. Iraq is a huge country with uh, too many differences right, and many proxy powerful regional actors. Right, right. Phyllis Venice, it, it does seem like the US is being reluctantly dragged back into some sort of level of intervention again into Iraq, if, if only at this stage talking of advisors. Might that change the dynamic of US intervention in Syria? This is a very dangerous moment. If the U.S. goes in militarily, it will make the situation in both Iraq and Syria much worse. I want to go back to what the Secretary General just said. There is a desperate need for a, a call for a ceasefire and a call for an arms embargo. There cannot be negotiations while new arms and repaired arms and all of that are flooding in to all sides. And of but course, right now, Russia is going to say, well, we're not going to. It doesn't seem like many people still believe this. there are negotiations worth pursuing anymore. There are it? not negotiations underway right now. But the point is that there cannot be negotiations, and there will ultimately mm -hmm. have to be negotiations at some point. The question is how many Iraqis, how many Syrians will have to die beforehand? I think the question of an arms embargo is very, very crucial. It's not going to happen quickly. It's not going to happen immediately. But the notion that we can somehow immediately engage militarily, and we should be very conscious of history here, it was through 400, quote, advisors that led to the U.S. war in Vietnam. It right. started with 400 advisors. Right. 300 me, advisors we, are now being a... sent to... Right, right. We've only got a few minutes or, or less than a minute left, so I want to give an opportunity to Marwan Kablan. All of these changing dynamics, you know, it all started in a sense with, with, uh, with what happened in Syria and groups in Syria feeling like they have an opportunity to reach out. If containment comes back to pushing the, the screws and some of the Sunni rebellion, where does that leave the internal dynamics of Syria? And the I war. think if you if you start uh, talking at uh, the very beginning, we all know that this started as an uprising by uh, a protest movement, a peaceful, a peaceful protest movement by uh, by those uh, uh, the, the certain social classes in Syria against the regime, trying actually to uh, have uh, reforms uh, uh, in Syria. But then, because it turned into a war by proxy in in this country, in which you have the both both sides having backers, regional and international, it turned out to be more or less a civil war. This is what we are having in right. Iraq, and this is the danger actually of the continuation of this situation. I think what Justice uh, said is really important in the right. sense that we need perhaps more 
uh, an arm embargo. We need a ceasefire. We need this war by proxy to, to stop. Come to an end. All right. I'm sorry. We'll have to leave it there. Let's thank our guests, Marwan Qablan here in the studio, Taha Ozhan in Ankara, and Phyllis Venice in the U.S. And, of course, remember, Al Jazeera has extensive and continuing coverage of what's happening in Syria on air and online. I'm Sami Zedan. Thanks for watching. For now, it's goodbye.